myth, and reality of the Gadar movement. Historians experience a dilemma when they take up their pen to write the history of the Gadar movement. It is mainly because there are myriad of aspects to the story, that it becomes tough to negotiate the transnational nature of the subject. Even the most realistic narration tends to end up in the dark alley of hegemonic interpretations. The writing of Gadar history, according to these versions, has to conform to the imaginary view of Indian nationalism. Historians, both in the East and West, attempt to pick only selective details, which may make the whole narrative either very simplistic, or just an aberration of irrationally excited minds. They avoid engaging the core of the problem, and fail to explain the contours of a wonderful dream, that made thousands of countrymen, mostly Sikhs to die for their country. Before embarking on their journey, many of them were baptized in Gurdwara Stockton, California. According to the Sikh tradition, when one takes a vow to offer one's head, the fear of death disappears. When the dream of one's own nation was born, it found its path to love, commitment and sacrifice. The ones who were initially in the forefront, but stayed back, the dream for them was just chimerical. For others, it was to carry their heads on their palms, and bring the butchers of the British Empire to Indian people's justice. They honored all their heroes of the past, and left a legacy for the future, that will keep on ringing notes of love, liberty, equality, and fraternity. For human beings, time comes to an end with death. Therefore, if we want to understand what it means to be an authentic human being, then it is essential that we constantly project our lives onto the horizon of our death. This is what Martin Heidegger famously calls, being towards death. If our being is finite, then an authentic human life can only be found by confronting finitude, and trying to make a meaning out of the fact of our death. Heidegger, a European thinker who challenged the Enlightenment, for its lack of appeal to heroic values, subscribes to the ancient maxim that, to philosophize is to learn how to die. Mortality is that in relation to which we shape and fashion our selfhood. That is why Gurbani teaches, if you wish to play the game of love, come to my path with your head in your palm, and, first accept death and give up any hope of life, become the dust of the world, and then you may come to me. The being of persons can be disclosed only in terms of existence. Scientific, psychological, evolutionary, sociological, or other facts about what human persons are, is the wrong evidence to interrogate, if we want to get at our being as persons. Analyzing existence is far different from analyzing things. Thingish analysis is categorial, you may categorize people physically, for example, as thin, fat, hairy, Polynesian, tall, male, young, and so on. This narrates what the object is by placing its characteristics in various categories. Such classification could describe your facts in exhaustive detail, and have all its details true, without even beginning to describe how you go about existing as a person in the world. Where the sciences undertake a categorical analysis of communities, cultures, and human persons in the rational sense, Heidegger also undertakes an existential analysis, of the process of being a person or belonging to a culture, i.e., he interrogates existentiality. The central structure of an experience is its intentionality or subjectivity. The terms existential and existentiality, always have to do with existing in a certain way in a world and over time. According to Martin Heidegger, any culture will persist in a vital way, only so long as individuals grasp the traditions, values, and possibilities chosen in the past, for their present and future. And if they don't, the culture will wither away. In short, your high storizing is both an individual and communal affair, and to the individual, there corresponds a community, to individual fate, there corresponds communal destiny. It is not possible for example, to have a musical society unless lots of people maintain an involvement with music. And such a society can persist over time, only if individual persons repeatedly choose to be involved with the possibilities it embodies. If they do this authentically, then they renew the vitality of these choices, and thereby, the culture of which they are a part. It is the authentic grasping of the past, 
the acceptance of what it really means for the present and future, that constitutes the authentic high storizing of it. Temporality involves being in a unity of past, present, and future. As a self, you will be your future self, but only in terms of having been your past self, the past for persons is not merely past, but still around. Selves, in other words, do not merely have a past, you live your past, you exist on the terms that your past makes available to you. This going back to what it has been, constitutes, together with a simultaneous coming towards the future and being with the present, the unity of your temporality. Temporality is an essential aspect of existence or being in the world according to Heidegger. The past, present and future are not three distinct things, but a single, integrated and living phenomenon. It is not in other words, clock time, or scientific time, you do not exist in time, but as a temporality of done that, doing this, and am going to do the other. Current centenary year of the Gadder Party, founded in America in March 1913, by Indians of Punjab origin, with overwhelming participation of the Sikhs to the level of 97%, has not remained confined to customary celebrations. American historian, Johanna Jo Ogden, who recently finished her five-year unpaid research in Portland and Astoria areas, where the emigrant Sikh lived before joining the Gadder Party, has published her studies in Oregon Historical Quarterly, a report in Portland Tribune. Diaspora Sikh researchers and their counterparts in Indian Punjab, also got prompted to re-evaluate the Gadder Uprising episode, and claimed that their investigations have thrown up altogether a different picture, than what was till recently, prevailed and projected by the historians. Five to six years ago, activists of the Gadder Party were being taken as staunch nationalist Indians, who transgressed communitarian and religious trappings. And those intellectuals, who brought out the other side of the story, have raised an accusing finger on the erstwhile historians of the Gadder Party, blaming them for the willful distortion of the history of the freedom struggle, so as to make it subservient to Indian nationalism anchored to Hindu religious ethos. Researchers and historians coming out with a new version of the Gadder history, have contended that the distortion began with Sohan Singh Josh, earlier communist activist of the 1920s era, who was obsessed with mechanical materialistic interpretation of communalism, a third-rate version of Eurocentric secularism. On becoming the editor of the Keir Tea Party's newspaper, after the death of its founder editor Santok Singh, former general secretary of the Gadar Party, who went to Amritsar following the failure of the Gadar movement, Josh made a deliberate bid to detach the newspaper from the older activists of the Gadar movement, who were practicing Sikhs, and who had drawn their revolutionary fervor from Sikh history and their religious cultural moorings. Those days in Punjab, the divide between the Kir Tea Party, comprising most of the Gadari Babas, and the Communist Party of which Josh was a member, continued to smolder even though both had joined hands on various anti-British agitation programs. Another pertinent difference between the two, was that the Gadari Babas were having closer and warm relations with leaders of the Akali Party, a political outfit of the Sikhs that came into existence in the 1920s, while the Communists were nursing a strong aversion to the Sikh religion and the Sikh way of life, which their cadres are having to this day. Being molded in that communist culture, Josh was the first to begin with the distortion of the Gadar Party's history, projecting the Babas as nationalists and seculars in his earlier write-ups, much before gaining a reckoning of being a third writer, to pen down a comprehensive history of the Gadar movement in 1978. Earlier to Josh, Gurucharan Singh Sainsara, another left activist, wrote the history of the Gadar Party in the 1960s, painting Gadari Babas as left-leaning secular nationalists, having no truck with the Akalis. His assertions however, are refuted by veteran Gadar party leader, Vaisakha Singh, who affirms in his writings. Some say I am a communist wanting to achieve Russian socialism. In truth, my aim is to fulfill the Tenth Master's mission, and my collectivism is in conformity with the Guru's ideal of egalitarian coexistence. In 1906, where was Russian socialism, when I embraced humanistic values for the welfare of humanity as an integral part of my thoughts and actions? 
whatever I have imbibed, has come from the Guru's abode. Communism has played a significant role in helping the destitute and downtrodden, but it has its shortcomings. On the other hand, Sikhism is universal. Communism is only one branch of Sikhism. That is to say, it can flow into Sikhism, but Sikhism cannot flow into it. The Guru's free community kitchen, collective service, the message your home is my home, has been propagated by the Guru for hundreds of years, and has laid emphasis on building harmonious relationships, and coexisting peacefully. End of quote. Before Gurucharan Singh Saint Sarah, Jagjit Singh, author of a path-breaking Sikhs history book, The Sikh Revolution, was the first historian to write the history of the Gadarites. His book Gadar Party Layer, came out in the late 1950s, but he too, being under the left intellectual's influence, could not do justice to the Gadar movement. Saint Sarah wrote the history in the Punjabi language, while Josh penned it down originally in English, later to be translated into Punjabi. Professor Harish Kumar Puri, was the first academician, to write on the Gadar party in English. His historical works got recognition throughout the country and abroad. Puri painted the Gadari Babas as secular nationalists who had shunned all sort of communal feelings, and detached themselves from their Sikh background. And, left activists and their supporting intellectuals do hail Puri's historical writings as an objective and authentic evaluation of the role of the Gadar party. Puri presented Lala Hardale as the brain behind the Gadar movement. Lala Hardale was inspired by the Bengali Hindu nationalists, Bankam Chatterjee, Aurobindo Ghosh, and V.D. Sarvarkar, the founder of RSS, and Hindutva political ideology. He convinced the Gadarites to adopt, Bandi Martram, as their slogan, and named the headquarter of their newspaper in San Francisco, as Ugantar Ashram. Ironically most of the Gadarite leaders from Punjab, were not aware of the anti-Muslim texture of the Bandi Martram slogan, as it had originated in the Bangla traditions. Otherwise, they would not have adopted it. Baba Sohan Singh Bukna, founder-president of the Gadar party, has himself corroborated this fact in his autobiography, Mary Ram Khani, stating that they were keen to keep Indian Muslims in the Gadar party's fold, and kept one in the party, even as his credentials were doubtful. We adopted the slogan thinking that it belonged to none of the participants, and helped them to remain united. Puri conveniently used innocence on the part of the Gadarites on this count, to come out with his intended conclusion, that the adoption of Bandi Martram proved the nationalistic credentials of the Gadari Babas, as the Sikhs among them had abjured their religious background and slogans like that of Bole So Nihal. Of late, Sewak Singh, a research scholar of Punjabi University Patiala, during his course study, raised a mild finger on hitherto accepted version of the history of the Gadar party, and wrote a critical article on the subject in a Punjabi weekly, Sikh Shahardat. That article inspired the Sikh intellectuals to explore the facts why the Sikhs had overwhelmingly joined the Gadar party, and why the Sikhs had constituted the majority of those executed and sent to the Andaman, and other jails. These queries prompted inquisitive Rajwinder Singh Rahi, to take up a serious study of the Gadar movement. In a short period, dedicated Rahi researched the records, dished out old documents, and authored three books on the subject. Real Story Behind the Gadar Movement Part 1 and Part 2, and Mary Ram Kahani, an autobiography of Baba Sohan Singh Bukna, the founder-president of Hind Association of Pacific Coast, which later came to be known as Gadar Party. Meanwhile, Ajmer Singh, a Sikh historian and author of three highly acclaimed books on Sikhs in history and politics of post-independent India, who guided and actively collaborated with Rahi in the latter's research project, has also come out with his new book on the Gadar Party, who were the Gadari Babas, Rejection of Distorted Claims in Punjabi. This book rejects the historicity hitherto built around the Gadar movement, and presents new and hitherto unknown facts, shredding to pieces the traditional interpretation from Indian nationalistic perspective. Till 2006, I was also of the conviction, as prevailing and largely acceptable, that the Gadari Babas had leftist orientation, 
or they were influenced by other ideologies and movements in the world, while remaining detached from Sikhism, its history, and ethos. It was during my work on another book, that I started realizing this perception was far from the truth. Then other material also started coming out, which threw fresh light on the orientation of the movement, says Ajmer Singh, a former Naxal ultra-communist leader of Punjab, who remained underground for 31 years from 1970 to 2001. Apart from referring to several works, Ajmer Singh has quoted extensively from great Bengali revolutionary Sachindra Nath Sanyal's autobiography, Bandi Jiwan. To quote Sanyal, Out of 6,000 to 7,000 revolutionaries who returned to India, only 25 to 30 were non-Sikh. Most of them were over the age of 40 years. By Nidan Singh, Baba Sohan Singh, Bai Kala Singh, and Bai Kher Singh, were at least 50. These Sikhs possessed a fiery spirit, and an unruffled peace of mind. They had the ability to endure all kinds of grave difficulties. Their broad chests, beards, and mustaches drew everyone's attention. None of them was educated, but they could read Sikh scriptures in their native language. They could only manage broken English at best. Even while living in America, they maintained their customs. If someone has to meet the Sikh Dal members, one has to go to Gedwaras where they are only seen, wrote Sachindra Nath Sanyal. In Amritsar, I met a Sikh Jathar from America. Most of the members were over 60 or 70 years of age, but they displayed tremendous courage. This is borne out from their struggles in the Andaman Islands, where they never once relented in their strikes. I spent a week with this Jathar and observed them closely. These Sikh Dal members will start reciting the Guru Granth Sahib early morning after taking a bath in the bitter cold season. They would call each other Santo, or Sajano in their conversations. I also met Baba Nidan Singh Chugga, who was 50 years of age. He had spent 30 years in foreign countries, and married a Chinese lady. I have often seen him reciting prayers from Sikh scriptures and delivering religious discourses. One time I saw him at a train platform reciting prayers from a gutka with intense devotion. This was not merely a pretense. I have seen him absorbed in prayer like this in the Andamans. He was far sharper than any young man I've met. This Sikh group and other Sikhs from foreign countries, made all the preparations necessary for mutiny in Punjab. Yet people in this country were indifferent to them. From my observations, there is no other nation in India as powerful, energetic, and vibrant as the Sikhs. Even when roused to action, they retain equanimity and tranquility of mind. There is no other nation in India like this. In the minds of numberless Sikhs, there was also the desire to re-establish Kalsaraj. In those days, Karta Singh worked indefatigably. Every day he used to cover a distance of 40 to 50 miles at a stretch in the rural areas, on his bicycle. He would go from village to village, and never get tired. His vitality only increased. Then he made the rounds of the garrisons he had not yet visited. When a new four-colored national flag was decided upon at Lahore, writes Sanyal, the Sikhs were very adamant to include their distinct color in the flag. He also writes of his meeting with Baba Gurmukh Singh Lultan in the post gadar period, a decade after the failed revolt. I went to Punjab and stayed in Lahore with Jaychandra Vidyalankar. Around that time, I came to know that Sardar Gurmukh Singh, who was building a new organization, does not wish to work with non-Sikh organizations in the revolutionary struggle for Indian independence. Gurmukh Singh even went as far as trying to woo our comrade Bhagat Singh to his party. Bhagat Singh told us everything Gurmukh Singh Ji said to him. In spite of his best efforts to lead Bhagat Singh on the wrong path, Bhagat Singh did not break from his comrades. I too met Gurmukh Singh a few times. He disclosed his party's secrets to me. I learned from him that his organization was influenced by Russian politics. But as far as I can remember, Gurmukh Singh was not a full-fledged Marxist. The reason being that he didn't subscribe to materialist values. If I remember correctly, Gurmukh Singh also said that there was no need to imitate Russia. 
I learned that Sardar Gurmukh Singh had just returned from Russia. He has an office based in Kabul. Gurmukh Singh has been to Kabul many times. He is trying to reorganize Sikhs on Bolshevik principles. In conversing with him, I got the impression that he doesn't want to join hands with non-Sikhs. I was saddened to hear this, but I came to realize that even revolutionary movements can be poisoned by communal feelings. I understood that Gurmukh Singh would not work with me anymore. End of quote. Sachindra Nath Sanyal, Bandi Jeevan The revolutionaries had purchased six duplicators to churn out revolutionary leaflets in Urdu, Gurmukhi, and Hindi. Karta Singh Sarabha worked tirelessly on these machines. In many villages, Kisans openly defied the police to give shelter to their revolutionary sons. In Amritsar district, Baba Jawan Singh Nihang of Pati, helped them secretly to some extent. Baba Sajan Singh Narangwal, a ninth-class student at Malwar Khalsa High School, Ludhiana, joined the revolutionaries after reading Gadar poetry. His first duty was to transport pistols, bombs, and ammunition. Later he spread propaganda in the 23rd Cavalry at Lahore. Gyani Harbhajan Singh Chaminda, who took Amrit from Birandir Singh's Jothar, also joined the movement after reading passages from, Echoes of Rebellion. He writes, The poems were first read to me by Bai Arjan Singh Kuk Rana, at Birandir Singh's house in Narangwal. The Gadar movement swept up a storm of patriotic feeling. Echoes of Rebellion poetry was on everyone's lips. I memorized all of the poems. Whenever I read aloud passages to a Dewan, I was roused with immense fervor. I would sing these poems when disseminating propaganda in the villages. Many people were filled with ardor, but most of them were too chicken-hearted, or loyal supporters of the British. In those days we used to hold secret meetings in Lohatbadi, Gujarval, Dandari, Narangwal, and Kanna. Unquote. Karta Singh, Randir Singh, and Nidan Singh, focused on Ferozpur, while Harnam Singh and Pr Singh traveled to the frontier cantonments. Sajan Singh Narangwal was sent to the Lahore cantonment, Nidan Singh and others to Jhelum, Rawalpindi, and Hadi Martin, and Dr. Mathura Singh and Amar Singh, were to stir up the Afridis on the frontier. Bhairandir Singh had some devoted friends in the 36 Cavalry, Ambala, notably Babu Mai Singh, Subedar Pra Singh, and Subedar Harbachan Singh. Bhairandir Singh asked Babu Mai Singh to join the armed revolt, but he helplessly refused and frankly said that he could not afford to sacrifice his duties to his family, and plunge into a revolt which meant courting disaster. By Adar Singh, who was an ex-soldier of the 35th Cavalry at Rawalpindi, and member of Bhairandir Singh's Jathar, maintained close relations with Sardar Kishan Singh Gargaj, of the 35th Cavalry at Rawalpindi. He kept him up to date with all developments. For more details, see by Ajmer Singh, who were the Gadari Babas. The whole thing was brilliantly organized. But the organization had one inherent weakness. Anyone who came into contact with them, was easily accepted in the inner circle. The government planted a spy on them, on getting some information, who wormed his way into the inner group within less than a week. While investigating and examining the evidence obtained in the Chubbar village robbery on February 2nd, Liakat Khan, DSP, suspected that the Gadarites were involved in the decoity and murder of the moneylender. Kala Singh, the blacksmith who was arrested in connection with the robbery, revealed after police torture, that Surain Singh Gilwali, had a personal vendetta with the moneylender. It was under his direction that the robbery was carried out. Surain Singh was subsequently arrested, and on interrogation, he blurted out the names of the Gadarites involved in the robbery, they were, Mula Singh, and Bai Pram Singh of village Sir Singh. On February 7, Liakat Khan, asked Zaldar Bela Singh, to find a man who personally knew some returned emigrants. On February 9, 1915, Bela Singh brought one Kirpal Singh, a relative of an emigrant Balwant Singh, who was planted as a spy. As this man knew Nidan Singh Chugga, he was able to get into the inner circle through him. 
with such credentials all had trusted him. He first got Mula Singh arrested, and replaced Mula Singh in the inner circle. On February 12, the Revolutionary Council High Command fixed February 21, 1915, as the date for collective mutiny and revolt, which Kirpal Singh conveyed to the police on 13 February, but the police reached the spot when all had dispersed. Kirpal Singh had contacts only with the Amritsar police. So he was not able to get any help from the Lahore police, who would have gotten there faster. Kirpal Singh then carried on as if he were a committed revolutionary, helping with final preparations among the 23rd Cavalry, and also among the villagers of Dadhur, near Amritsar, some of whom had been assigned to loot the local police station, seize its arms, and march to Lahore. In actuality, he was arranging to have them ambushed. But Kirpal Singh had started to provoke suspicion through some indiscretions in asking questions, and even more after being sighted at the railway platform in Amritsar, waiting for the police, when he was supposed to be in Lahore with the 23rd. By Nidan Singh was the first to come to know that Kirpal Singh was a spy, but the revolutionary leaders did not think it wise to do away with him immediately. They however kept a close watch on him. The Revolutionary Council, changed the date of mutiny to February 19, in an informal meeting on February 14, 1915. Up to February 17, the change of the date was kept a closely guarded secret, among four or five top leaders. The date of revolt had been changed from February 21 to February 19, but only top leaders knew it. The change had not been as yet passed as a resolution by the Revolutionary War Council. On the night of February 14, Bhairandir Singh Narangwal, was going to Dandhari to perform Akhand Pot, the continuous recitation of Guru Granth Sahib, in the house of Sardar Hardit Singh, a military man. Karta Singh Sarabha, knew about his program. The young revolutionary waited on the Gil Malair Kotler Road to contact Bhairandir Singh. After some hours of waiting he saw Bhairandir Singh coming. Gyani Harbhajan Singh Chaminda, was with Bhairandir Singh during this meeting. He has given the author a written account of what transpired between them. The saint embraced Karta Singh Sarabha. Karta Singh then informed Bhairandir Singh, that spy Kirpal Singh had leaked out the date of mutiny, February 21. So it had been changed to February 19. They were to meet him on the outskirts of Pharaoh's per cantonment. Karta Singh then suggested that the Jathar should wear white turbans instead of black, and should not bring any weapons, as the weapons would be supplied by the army mutineers. Bhairandir Singh told him that they will wear black turbans, and would also keep some weapons like the swords and axes, in case they were necessary before other weapons come to hand. Karta Singh Sarabha, told him that cars and taxis were ready to bring the Lahore and Amritsar revolutionaries, while Bhairandir Singh and his companions were advised to come by train, in the form of a wedding party, and reach Ferozpur by sunset. After lengthy and enthusiastic discussions lasting for about two hours, Karta Singh disappeared into darkness. Bhairandir Singh was strongly against robberies, loot and plunder for the sake of money. He not only resented it, but also did not allow any of his companions to have anything to do with such activities. That is why he kept his group, called the Tat Kal Sajathar, quite apart, independent of central command and completely under his control. That is why he did not accept the overall leadership of the Gadar movement. That is why he did not care to meet leaders like Rosby Hari Bose, and other bomb cult revolutionaries, even though he went to Amritsar during this period once. By Nidan Singh Chugga, Karta Singh Sarabha, and Gandha Singh met him almost every week. He assured the key Gadar leaders, that he and his companions would participate only in armed revolt against the British army. He expressed his resentment against killing of civilians for money. By Nidan Singh Chugga, was one of his strongest supporters of this line of approach. On February 15, Gyani Harbhajan Singh Chaminda, Bhairandir Singh and his Jathar, attended an Akhand pot at Bhai Sajan Singh's house. Gyani Harbhajan Singh also served as one of the scripture readers. Gyani Harbhajan Singh writes, I was one of the scripture readers, 
and during Kirtan, I enjoyed the heights of spiritual bliss with Bhai Sahibrandir Singh. It was the kind of bliss that cannot be expressed in words. Just as the mute person has trouble describing the taste of sugar, it is difficult to put into words. After the Akkand Pot and Kirtan, Bhai Sahib called Arjatthar for a secret meeting at Dandari. Bhairandir Singh held one of his closed-door meetings at Dandari on February 17, and the second at his residence on the morning of February 19. The question of armed rebellion was thoroughly discussed. One of his companions suggested that Bhairandir Singh as a saintly person, should keep himself above politics. He should not covet any power. To this Bhairandir Singh replied, that he was not fighting for power, but as a Sikh of Guru Gobind Singh, it was his unfailing duty to fight for freedom. A Sikh should not tolerate slavery of any kind. He also was not prepared to discuss the question of failure or success. When we fight for freedom, he said, our duty is to be prepared to fight till you succeed. A soldier does not concentrate on speculations of what might happen. He fights for victory. Without winning freedom, we can't free our Gadwaras and religious institutions. Therefore we cannot allow the British government to remain in this country. We must all reach Ferozpur in preparation for the mutiny. A resolution was then unanimously passed. All were instructed to gather at Narangwal on the morning of February 19, before proceeding to Ferozpur. Gyani Harbhajan Singh writes, Kabir, I long to die, great warriors tremble at the thought of death, but what a wonderful sight it was, when all of us collected at Narangwal, longing for death like moths, yearning to burn themselves in fire. Karta Singh warned us not to wear black turbans, so we bought 40 square feet of khaki cloth. The cloth was torn up, and every person was given one square foot to wear over their turbans, at the time of mutiny. In the afternoon, Ardaz was performed, and we all marched to Mullanpur station shouting Jaykaras. On the evening of February 19, Bhairandir Singh along with 60 companions, boarded a train from Mullanpur at 6 p.m. for Ferozpur. With him were prominent revolutionaries like Bainadan Singh, Gandha Singh, Ishar Singh, Gyani Harbhajan Singh and others. Along the way they sang Kirtan hymns of Guru Gobind Singh. They got down at Ferozpur Kant Railway Station, and waited at the place where they were supposed to meet Karta Singh Sarabha. Eighty more Singhs arrived with pistols and revolvers. Because the revolt was brought forward by two days, people from villages couldn't assemble at the cantonments. Karta Singh told them to wait outside, while he went inside the cantonment to procure weapons. After hours of waiting he didn't return. The mutiny was supposed to begin at 12 a.m., but it was now 1 a.m. Bhai Gandha Singh kept asking, why is he taking so long? The government had come to know about this date also. Karta Singh fearlessly entered the well-guarded cantonment, and came to know that eight of the sepoys on whom he counted, had been discharged. Five of them were actually marched to the railway station on the morning of February 19, and entrained for their homes. Some of them had come back at night, and told him the whole story. They merely pointed at the white soldiers stiffly parading the distance. During the night of February 18th and early next morning, people in the major cities of the province, saw truckloads of white soldiers pouring in. Together with the police they posted themselves at the key points, and started patrolling the streets. In the cantonments too, the British soldiers had taken over the arsenals, the watch was increased and military discipline enforced more rigorously. The onlookers watched these grim preparations, and wondered if these were some emergency war measures. One man sent by Karta Singh into the cantonment, was taken into custody. Karta Singh Sarabha, then met by Randir Singh and his men, among the reeds outside the cantonment, and asked them to disperse. He looked very disappointed, writes Gyani Harbhajan Singh Chaminda, but so were we, when we received the bad news. From Pharaoh's per cant, they walked to Kai Railway Station, from where they boarded a train for Mullanpur early next morning, and came back to Narangwal. Gyani Harbhajan Singh went to his village Chaminda. Lance leader, Baba Kirpa Singh Lang Masri, 
who joined the army in 1914, with the intention of aiding the rebellion, writes. I was in charge of the dispensary at the pharaohs per cantonment. In those days Karta Singh Sarabha and Pinglay used to visit me frequently. We discussed plans of the revolt in great detail. At last, the day arrived when a new chapter would be written in the history of India. The gatteries were divided into three units. One unit was led by me, and the other two by Bhairandir Singh, and by Lob Singh. Everyone came armed on that day. By Lob Singh and I entered the cantonment. Much to our dismay, when we asked the Subedar for the keys to the magazine, we were told that our plans were ruined. British troops had taken control of the arsenal from native troops. Kirpal Singh had divulged our plans to the British government, and now they were coming after our Jathars. No sooner had the alarm been raised, than the artillery started arriving. The pharaohs per cantonment was surrounded on all sides, and white troops could be seen approaching in two files. By Lop Singh and I, stealthily headed for the exit, when we were spotted by searchlights. Officers came running towards us, and pointed their rifles at our chests. We were questioned. We kept a calm appearance and began shouting, Attention! Attention! But they didn't spare us. They handed us over to the sentry at the entrance, and went to the other side of the cantonment to conduct a search. That sentry was quite negligent. He would leave his rifle standing against a wall to smoke a cigarette. When he wasn't looking, I gave Lop Singh the signal to snatch the rifle, while I pushed him out of the way. We did just that, and escaped with his rifle. We reached Chamarla Sahib Gidwara. Some time later I was arrested. A member of our party, Anork Singh was arrested, and disclosed our secrets during interrogation. A warrant was immediately issued for my arrest. Unquote. On the 18th or 19th morning, Spy Kirpal Singh came to know about the changed date, from a man who did not know that Kirpal Singh was a spy. Kirpal Singh immediately told a CID officer in plain clothes about the changed date. Finding Kirpal Singh nervous, and in the know of the date, by Sajjan Singh Narangwal informed the revolutionaries at their hideout in Lahore. The Gadarites instructed by Sajjan Singh to take Kirpal to village Sor Singh, on the pretext of collecting more men from the village, and then to finish him off. Then they should all assemble at the Lahore cantonment. He was handed a key to the safe house next to the hideout. It contained bombs and pistols. Kirpal had no inkling about this house. In the afternoon, another meeting was held on the roof of the hideout. At the end of the meeting, Kirpal Singh and Bai Sajjan Singh were coming down the steps, when Sajjan Singh noticed police officers in plain clothes, carrying pistols a short distance away. Sajjan Singh writes, I walked right past the officers. No one stopped me. Then more officers arrived with rifles on their shoulders, and surrounded the hideout on all four sides. At 4.30 p.m., Kirpal Singh went up on the roof of the building, and shouted to the police to save him. The police had by now surrounded the building. They arrested all those who were there, and also took away the papers and documents from the Gadar office. Kirpal Singh Bra, fled. Bai Sajjan Singh went to the Anarkali Bazaar in Lahore, and met Rosby Hari Bose. He stayed here for a few days, and handed him the key to the safe house. He then took a train from Shadra station to Lyalpur. It was too risky to take a train from Lahore station, because police pickets were posted there. Four months later, he was arrested by Lambardar Karam Singh, the younger brother of the notorious Gajan Singh Narangwal. Hundreds of arrests took place over the next few months. Karta Singh Sarabha, and his companions, Harnam Singh Tundilat, and Jagat Singh, were arrested at a military stud in Sargodha. As might be expected of three such firebrands, said Ismunger and Slattery, they continued to harangue the bystanders, even as they were arrested. Little is often said, about the influence of Sikh ideology on the mind of Bhai Harnam Singh Tundilat, and his friends. Harnam Singh worked with Karta Singh, on the editorial board of the Gadar Press in San Francisco. While Uttam Singh Kasale, 
started imparting military training to party volunteers, and Karta Singh Sarabha went to the east coast of America to train as an aircraft pilot, Harnam Singh learned bomb making from an American friend. During an experiment, on July 5, 1914, his left hand was blown off, as a result of which his left arm had to be amputated well above the wrist. He was given by his comrades the new name of Tundi Lat, the armless lord. In one of his articles he writes. In India, women are treated as an inferior species to men. But this is far from the truth. In Africa for instance, Gujarati women have been four steps ahead of men in fighting discriminatory laws. They have worked just as hard as men in the fields, and have displayed as much courage as men in going to jails. Now I would like to ask the Singhs who were transformed into lions by Guru Gobind Singh's Amrit, and who would claim that they could single-handedly fight 125,000 men, whether baptismal ceremonies like this are being organized to initiate Singhs. Today those preparing Amrit, are slaves of the government. The Granthis of Gidwaras can be seen bowing before British officers. How can these inferior men invigorate courage and bravery in the nation? No change will occur until lion-hearted leaders like Guru Gobind Singh become the vanguard of the people. The Singhs need to carefully consider this, and purge our places of worship from such Granthis. Gyani Harbhajan Singh Chaminda, along with Bai Sir Jan Singh Gujar, was arrested from his village four months after the failed gadar. Their comrade, Bhagat Singh Balowal turned approver, and spilled out their names. They were arrested and sent to the local police station, from where they managed to escape unnoticed. They ran to the wide bazaar in Ludhiana, and then went to a village by foot. The following night, they stayed in Makshiwara and then remained in hiding for four months in Hoshiarpur, Patiala, and Nabha. A reward of 1,000 rupees was put on their heads. Out of greed, Lambardar Ram Singh of village Javdi, near Ludhiana, had him arrested from Rampura Full Railway Station. Gyani G writes, We were arrested from Rampura Full Station on September 15, 1915, and taken to Ludhiana in handcuffs. We were interrogated for two or three days. We were beaten. Officers swore at us. Bribes were given. Many coercive methods were used. But we bore the torture. The police used all of its force, but we revealed nothing to them. Gyani Harbhajan Singh was sent for trial and sentenced to transportation for life to the Andamans. The sentence was reviewed however, and reduced to three years imprisonment because of his young age. We have challenged the prevailing thesis, and now let there be honest answers 